Ken Dunkley um, or Kenneth J. Dunkley, middle initial J. And um, I'm a holographer. And uh, I typically have to, uh, once, once I say that, I have to explain that I'm, I'm known uh, famously for one particular hologram. And uh, I recently, I've been making holograms about one every 20 years. I get dragged back into my friends, call me up and say, Ken, how about another hologram? And uh, so I'm actually due for another one now. I'm being called back to actually do make create another hologram. And um, I'm looking forward to it. So where did your passion come from <clears throat> for your work? Well, um, my passion comes from my building and flying model airplanes. Uh, which I'd done from a young age until I got into college. Um, I wanted to be a, an aeronautical engineer and build airplanes. But uh, somehow I, um, while at NYU, New York University, I somehow um, managed to enjoy physics more than I did aeronautical engineering. So I switched over into physics and um, enjoyed that very much. You know, quantum theory, physical things that one can figure out anyway. But um, I loved it and uh, switched over. Um, managed to got my undergraduate degree and um, continued at NYU to work on a doctorate. Actually, I was there for 11 more years. Although I didn't get my doctorate, um, I do have a master's. And um, during that time, I created the uh, known most for thoughts. And um, the rest is history. So, where did your hologram, um, how, what is the, um, how did, did it start? Where did you have the idea? Well, the, the idea, um, you know, I was, spent two years getting ready to you know create some ho holograms those two years were involved in refining my techniques and as i um set up to create one hologram all of a sudden one night i had this flash i had this realization of a holographic staircase of a holographic staircase. You got to put that in your mind, hold on to it. And um, it just blew my mind out. And I went down and I started working on this thing. And I worked like three months on it. And when it finished, uh, it re really, at that time, it really represented a number of breakthroughs. Once because two things, it was a, it was a first hologram of a hologram of a hologram. But more than that, it actually expressed something. Uh, it expressed the, the, um, the fundamental parameters that I dealt with in, in, in terms of philosophy. And it all came together in this image that just blew me out. And it blew a lot number of other people out also. Uh, once I showed it to people, uh, it was just immediate gratification. And um, Thoughts has that, um, I, I titled it Thoughts. It was initially called uh, Man in the Sand or Face in the Sand, because basically it's a face in the sand. And um, um, it, it, uh, it has an aura to it that's, uh, undefinable but really there and um it ex sort of expressed everything i ever felt about life and our creation and what it is that we are as as people okay. and consciousness it's like it's con it's an expression of consciousness it's a celebration of consciousness okay. um and um I'm, I'm hoping that one of these uh, days you get a chance to see it in life and uh Photos are good, but it's good to see it for real. So um, with all the people you met, 
what what would you say you learned about people about human being oh about human beings oh boy that if you love them they will love you back i mean that's just, that's sort of fundamental and the other thing is that everyone makes mistakes <laughs> that's number two and um number three it's just so wonderful to be alive so are you proud of your creations oh very much so but i think i'm more proud of my children my other children my real children uh, i have two um about your age um no, they're probably older than you. <laughs> and um, it took me a while to learn that. One day I was, I was, uh, this was back in the seventies. What happened was I was, I had two children because my daughter was born in 69. My son was 70, born in 71. Uh, two children, I had a full-time job teaching at college a part-time job working on my degree and making holograms at four o'clock in the morning. Wow. Somewhere in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. And a friend of mine, it was um, Sam Moray, M-O-R-E-E. -E. He's a holographer, He's a well-known holographer. He came up to me and said to me, Ken, how are you doing this? How, you've got two kids. You got a job, you've got, you know, a wife. How can you be here at four o'clock in the morning every morning? Yes, that's crazy. And it was like, I woke up. It's like, he asked me that question and I woke up. And I mean, I really woke up and I realized that I needed to put my focus to my kids. I realized at that point I had spent all my time for the last, I don't know, 12 years, 11, 12 years working on me, doing my thesis, working, you know, studying and working my thesis. And I had two kids and I needed to get a better job to support them. And that's what woke me up, him asking me that question. Okay. How do I get all of this done? In reality, I wasn't getting it done because it was stretching. It was stretching my marriage. Yeah. And from then, uh, I realized what was important in life, and what was important were my kids, and not so much what I was trying to. I had this great idea of opening up holography, uh, bringing holography to the world all of these wonderful things, but the reality was I needed to, to really work with my children. Anyway, so that was, that was something that uh, in my life was uh, very uh, important. So mm -hmm. do you have an advice or a message to young people who would like to realize a project or a dream? Oh yes, um, thank you for that question. And uh, the thing that I share with young people, that I have shared with young people uh, on multiple occasions, is that wh whatever they want to be, they should start now. You don't wait to get old or till you grow up or till you get money or whatever, or till you get the time. You should start now. And I always, direct them to learn the history of a subject before you do anything, read about the history. Because if you know only the history of virtually any topic, you are able to sit down with a person who's really versed in that field. Okay, so for instance, if one day you happen to bump into your doctor, you can't have a conversation with him unless say you studied the history of medicine 
And that, you and that real doctor can actually sit down there and share. Um, it, um, studying the history allows you to get a head start. Um, and sooner or later, you're gonna find out that you love it more, this subject that you're interested in, you're gonna love it more or less. And if you love it less, so it tells you right away, maybe you need to look at something else. Okay. And of course, if you love it more, which is more likely, uh, it really focuses you and sort of, uh, it makes you smarter all around just by studying the history of a topic. Shall I, shall, can I, can I add the little, the story yeah. of myself that um, occurred to me when, uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, something like that. Uh, a friend of my father, who was a doctor, professor at Downstate Medical, Dr. Cyril Jones, um, he invited me. He wanted me because he knew I was really fabulous in cutting things and just the way I worked. He invited me to come with him to work on guinea pigs and extract their spleens and literally cut open the spleens of guinea pigs. Of course, he was in the process of doing cancer. He was doing a project on cancer research at Downstate Medical in Brooklyn. And um, he had me in a number of times. We would suit up, put on the, the scrub outfits that doctors wear, and then go into an operating room. And what I learned from that was I hated it. <laughs> I did not like medicine at all. Um, it sort of gave me a head start as to, that was one of the things I did not like. And um, I, I think I loved engineering that much more. So that, that was just my experience with sort of uh, learning something about a subject okay. and finding out I didn't like it. What do you think about in tough moments? What helped you during your career? Um, well, I mean, there, there was, I'm trying to give you a rational uh, result. There was one tough moment in my life. There was really one tough moment in my life when I was about to um, flunk out of uh, college. I had three Fs and two Ds. It was my first semester of college, not at New York University, but at a small college. Before I got into New York University, I went to Bronx Community College, which was a two-year college. And I struggled to get into that college because I had very poor grades, very poor grades. And I got into the college by accident. Not too many people get into college by accident, but I did. And during the first semester, I had three Fs. After four months, I had three Fs and two Ds. And my advisor was, had told me that I wouldn't be around for much longer if I didn't figure out a way to get my grades up. And what happened was, during a three-day period before an exam, my chemistry exam, I figured out a way to get straight A's, but I didn't know it, that it worked. And what happened was, I, after three days of this new technique, this new study technique, I walked in and got the first A on any exam I had ever taken, because I never got an A in high school. I got my first A and then a few days later, I took another test and got a second A, then a third A, and a fourth A, and a fifth A, and a sixth A, and the rest was history. I got a series of straight A's that allowed me to transfer into New York University and study aeronautical engineering, which is what I wanted to do. I'm not sure if that answers your question, yeah, Stephen, yeah, yeah. but it was sure a tough time in my life. Okay. And. Um, I didn't tell you what I did, but I will save that for another interview, maybe. So are there people who, that you would like to thank? You would like to say thank you to some people?
Wow. Um, I'd like to thank my first wife for putting up with me. <laughs> my first ex-wife for putting up with me even that long. Um, I'd like to thank my sister, Tina, uh, Tina Dunkley, um, who's an artist and curator. Uh, I, um, gee, um, my mom, my dad, everyone helped me. I think uh, at some point. Um, my companion, Dr. Mitchell, and um, my advisor, Henry. Um, you know who you are. Um, well, I didn't expect this question. You really got me. Uh, love my brother and um, my two kids. Okay. They're wonderful. They made life so much easier for me. You know, when you when you when your kids are doing everything almost right or right, it makes life easier for you. You know what I mean? It really does. So, could you talk about your creation? Um, how does it call? Oh, I'd love to. 3D glasses, sure. Yeah. I'd love to. And. Uh, um, Starting from the beginning, I, I, I'll, I'll, um, I have to start where it started. It all started at the Franklin Institute when I was giving a series of lectures about holography. And I was uh, exp explaining to an audience why holography had difficulties in certain areas regarding art holography. Um, it was very difficult for, for artists in the mainstream. We did, it was very difficult for holography to break into the mainstream area of art, what's called art. And I tried to explain the situation to the persons attending the, the lecture and um, what I shared with them was that holograms, even though they have lots of 3D going, they have 3D going for them, some of them um, don't have the, the, the color enhancement that's available in an ordinary print, an ordinary photograph. And during that time, um, I looked for a point of equivalence between holograms and photography. And there is a point where they come together and that's when you start viewing them through small, tiny apertures. That may not be that, that obvious, but when you observe holograms and also photographs through small apertures, you see a, a, a type of equivalence. So I started looking through holes at things. And um, it's, it's a wonderful, if you haven't tried it, it's wonderful to look through a single hole at a well-lit photograph. If you haven't, if you've never done it, uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a known effect where if you do that, the picture will appear to have extensive depth associated with it. This has been known for many hundreds of years. I'm told it goes back to, to Greek and Roman times. Okay. But uh, I'm sure they didn't have photographs back then. But in any event, during the course of that, I started working with tubes, with holes, and um, I, I'm pulling out a device. And what basically what we're talking of, <clears throat> what we're talking about is a tube with two holes on either end. There's, there's a hole here and there's a hole there. And 
what happens if you look through the device on axis, you get this uh, intense, intense depth sensation, even though it's not stereo. It's not stereoscopic, but it's intensively, the depth is enhanced tremendously. And um, as I shared uh, with people that what happened was one day I accidentally operated this device or it was one similar to this off axis, which means I sort of like moved it like this. I moved it like this by accident. And when I did, uh, the image popped up in, in a stereo and like, it looked 3D. And uh, <clears throat> what happened was <clears throat> um, it, um, it gave me the impression <clears throat> that, uh, that my mind had, uh, was seeing something that wasn't there. So uh, I can initially concluded that I had worked too, too, uh, too much um, and that uh, my knowledge of 3D had somehow altered my brain and made me imagine that I'm seeing 3D. And um, it was after some time, after doing it daily for time, hour after hour after hour, that I came to the realization that this effect was there. And then I started uh, attempting to show it to individuals, other individuals uh, beside myself. But, um, uh, and um, the persons I, I showed it to uh, were able to detect it also. So I realized it, it wasn't me. I wasn't, I wasn't crazy. Okay. And um, that's, that's how it started. Can I, can I add the portion where I had friends from New York call me. Yes. Um, I, I didn't uh, mention that part of it. Um, that that story sort of continues when I when I dis when I discovered this uh, thing. I told some friends, my um, holography friends in New York City, about it, and um, they thought I had lost my mind also, and they called and said to me that they loved me and wanted me to come into New York to show them what I had said I had found. And uh, I did that. And um, Sam Moray was there, Dan Schweitzer was there, and Rod and Jody Burns were there, was there. Um, and I showed it to the three of them and they were like mesmerized by it at that time because um, it was just a crazy idea that I was somehow you can visualize. Of course, the part that I really left out was that this thing for artists represents a conundrum. If you're an artist, a person who makes pictures, okay. um, you're really caught in, in a quandary because it boils down to the definition of what is a picture? What, may, what, what is a picture? How do you define a picture? And when you, when you talk about pictures, you, a, a picture is defined by the fact that it creates, somehow it creates an illusion of depth. Okay. Et du coup, son travail a picture aussi. is something that creates the illusion. That's how you know it. That's how you know you've got a picture in front of you. It has the illusion of depth. Yeah. A painting, not so well. The graphics, nah, not at all. But a photograph, you know it's a photograph because it gives you this intense illusion of depth. Well, what the invention, what this in invention does is make you realize that you can alter that. You can actually see a picture. What this thing does, what I didn't mention to you is that you can adjust this from the appearance of an ordinary picture. As you look through this and adjust it, you start, you can, you're looking at an order, you look at an ordinary, it's an ordinary picture. And then as you tweak it and adjust it, it becomes more 3D, more 3D, and all of a sudden it's stereoscopic. And then you can look into it out into infinity. So that illusion of depth is really not an illusion. Is that what we're saying? That illusion of depth, you can actually access it. And once you access it, that illusion of depth 
turns into the appearance of depth. And once it appears, it's stereoscopic. Okay. And that's how you, different stereo, a stereo, stereoscopic image is different than a regular image because you're actually seeing depth in these images, typically created by two different sets of uh, images, taken left and right. You bring them both to the eyes and, and you get something different. You see more information. There's more information inherently in a stereoscopic image than in a flat image. And somehow you're able to extract, using this device, you're able to extract, literally extract more information out of a photograph. You can look at it straight and then look at it through this, you get more information from this. Well, the other one is, it's, is the, because it, it, it's important to, to realize that in order to wrap your head around this invention, it's important to realize that I, I did not patent these, these are various devices, but yeah. they gave me a patent, not only on devices, they gave me a patent on the process. It's a process. And so the process is written on the face of, the, um, well, not all of it, but 90% of the process is written on the face, on the face of this uh, little um, piece of cardboard. It's a piece of cardboard with a hole in it. It's, it's stupid, excuse me for saying so. It's, it's actually brilliant. And you look through it and you move it according to the instructions. And what that does is induce 3D stereoscopic vision in your mind's eye. And it's the process of moving this that they actually, that I got the patent on along with devices, physical devices. So those are, that's sort of a subtlety that that uh, may not be obviously apparent. Okay. And that's, that allows me to this, to use my fingers. I actually patented the use of my fingers. <laughs> I did. Um, you could do that. Patent the use of my fingers uh, as, you, as you look through. Oh, okay. As you look through it. Okay, but it's tricky. Okay. So do you want to say a last word what would be your last word what do you want to say something to to finish the interview oh you can say what you want <laughs> well it's uh, well it's 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 wonderful getting the opportunity to to share with the world um this uh, device this device uh, i would add that i think artists and artists who and and or photographers uh, have something to gain might have much to gain from just trying it out relative to their work if you produce images of any kind um, try looking at it through a couple of, of, of uh, pinholes and um, see what happens and also I need to share with you that all of this information was put on the web around 93, though, the, roughly 93, and that couple of years around that. And um, it was out of you know frustration in at the time in dealing with it, trying to uh, sell it when I realized I needed to share with people the more important aspect of how do you do it. So that's why I'll, I created, that's why I created the, the workshop. And um, there is a website that you can go to that in 15 minutes, you can try it out. And. Um, okay, so you can send us the link. Three, three dash dvg dot three dash dvg dot org. 